Okay. So last week we did end by talking about the snowball method. I know some of you say you have done that before. Uh, paying off your smaller debts first so you can see progress to motivate you, taking that money and then rolling it over into the larger ones and paying those off little by little. And uh, if you ever built a snowman, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was talking to some students yesterday and they said, oh yeah, we had the opportunity to travel to New York or this place and it was the first time in our life we saw snow. I remember the first time I saw snow, I was super excited, but it didn't last too long. And you have to shovel it and you have to do all those other things, you know, and it gets really, really cold. And then we talked about avoiding late fees, all the things that we can avoid, right? The interest. Interest is your enemy. You want to avoid interest like the plague, all right? So and it, it, interest works against you. It's taking money out of your pocket. Uh, we talked about renegotiating with credit card companies for lower rates. Uh, they're motivated because they would rather get the money because they'll, they'll lose some of that money. They, some of them have insurance, but still. Uh, we talked about loss of employment, how to prevent, be, be prepared for that. And so this morning we're going to pick up with home, owning a home. Perhaps some of you may own property, multiple properties, I don't know. But a lot of people don't understand. Uh, it's kind of a catch-22 because owning property is probably one of the most valuable things that you can have, but it also could be a headache. That's the trade-off, right? It's very valuable. It's actually better than money in the bank, uh, but it's a lot of upkeep, a lot of responsibility. So the question this morning I want to pose is, is, is owning a home a wise investment? Okay, that's a good question, isn't it? And so we're going to start off by looking at some comparison and looking at which is a better investment. Because a lot of times when we have a little extra money, when we get to that point in our life, when we do have a little bit of extra money, where do we put that money? What do we do with it, right? And so we're going to look at an example that I have here. We're going to look at a $100,000 home, even though those don't exist anymore. We're going to use that because it's simple, right? Simple math. So we're going to get a $100,000 home over 10 years at a rate, a 6% rate of appreciation. So when you buy a home, you have to put at least minimum 20% down. Now, there are some deals where you put less down, but you have to pay what we call PMI, Property Mortgage Insurance. And that's the extra payment because you didn't put, because you're, the bank is going to be at a risk because you're putting less money down for that property and they charge you extra for that. Okay, it's called PMI. All right, so assuming you're putting the 20% down on a $100,000 home, that's $20,000, right? So that's why I want to keep it simple, simple math. So what's your initial investment on that $100,000 house? $20,000. So that's the only thing that you're putting, pulling out of your pocket, right? Or your bank account is $20,000. Now let's talk about the stock exchange or the money market account. You're investing $100,000 in the stock exchange over 10 years, but at a greater percentage rate, 13% annual average appreciation. So you're putting 100% down, which is how much? $100,000 to buy those stocks, because you can't borrow to buy stocks, by the way. You can't do it. If they find out you borrow money to pay for stocks, they, they don't allow that. It's a scam, right? They don't allow that. So let's go ahead and look at some of the numbers. So. Uh, in 10 years, if you put $20,000 down, 20% down on a $100,000 property, uh, in 10 years, it'll have a value at a 6% rate of appreciation of $185,000, okay? And so what was your initial investment? $20,000. Some of you are thinking, well, yeah, but we have to pay every month. Well, you don't count that because you gotta live somewhere anyway. So whether you put money in stocks or that, you still gotta pay for somewhere to live, so we don't look at that. So your initial investment was $20,000, so what you do is you take one hundred eighty-five thousand minus twenty thousand, and what do you get? One hundred and sixty-five thousand. So you made you got a return of one hundred and sixty-five thousand on a twenty thousand dollars investment. Okay. All right. Now, looking at I'm sorry, eighty-five thousand. I'm sorry, value, because the home is is worth one hundred thousand. Okay, initially. Now you look at the stock exchange, and in ten years it's more. It's two hundred ten thousand dollars return because it's thirteen percent, but what was your initial investment? $100,000. So where did you get the greater gains? On the home, okay? Does that make sense? So homes appreciate over time. They always are gonna appreciate. That's never changed. Even if there's a recession or whatever, in the end of the day, the homes are always, property is always gonna gain value. Even land, it doesn't matter, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and look at some tips on buying a home. And again, maybe this is not even applicable to some of you, but it's something you can pass on, uh, wisdom that you can have. Uh, so I know I have the answers on here, but I'm going to ask anyway. 
when you look at your budget, and that's why it's important to have a budget so you'll know where you're at because you can't make any of these decisions until you have your budget in place, okay? So when you have your budget in place, what percentage of your budget do you want to, the max percentage you want to spend in the home? 25%. A lot of people don't know that. They think, well, I make $125,000 a year so I can afford that at home. But that's not true. You want to look at 25%. No more than, and that includes taxes, insurance, and everything. That's what you can actually afford. It's like when you go buy a car, what do they focus on? What are your payments, right? But what if you don't have that same job a year from now, right? Can you still afford to pay for it, right? So those are the things, you, and then you lose out on that. So that's what you want to look at. 25% is the deal, all right? Now, newer homes usually have a warranty and are less likely to have problems, but you want to do your research. Who is the builder? That's a very important that you find out who the builder is, right? Or is it a reputable company? Is it a new company? Uh, sometimes you might want to avoid new companies. I don't know, you know, because uh, what kind of materials are they using? Uh, do you know anything about building a home? If you don't know anything at all about building a home, I would advise you not to do it. Or if you don't have anybody in your family you trust to be able to oversee it, they cut, contractors cut, cut costs all the time. Be careful about that. Okay. Uh, we find that also homes are usually cheaper when you go to a rural area. That's true everywhere, right? Homes in Wessico and Dunn are cheaper than McAllen. That's just the truth, right? So if you're going to buy something like that, you want to calculate in and consider the fuel, the gas you're going to put in your car for traveling, all those things you want to take in consideration. Uh, we one time bought a foreclosure. We got it at a really good price, but it needed a lot of work. So we wound up breaking even on that property. And it was actually an upscale home, so we had to, guess what? When you buy an upscale home, you have to put what kind of finishes in it? Upscale finishes. So it's usually the cheaper homes that are better to buy. You put cheaper finishes, and you don't have to put so much money into it. Lesson learned, right? And so you want to keep that in mind, all right? Or if you're not good at fixing up things and doing some of the things yourself, then you probably don't want to purchase a foreclosure. It'll turn into a headache. I think they had a movie called, uh, I think Tom Hanks was in it. It was called Money Pit or Money Trap or something like that. I've never seen anything that bad before. Of course, it's a movie to exaggerate, but that, it could turn out something like that, all right? Uh, one time, many years ago, my, my aunt bought a house where people were unfortunately going through a divorce, and she was able to get a very good deal on the home because they were just ready to get rid of it. And so things like that, estate settlements and things like that, you can find some really good deals on homes that way as well. Um, usually when uh, you're going to the market to buy a home, uh, real, realtors are not your friend. As much as they put on a pretty smile, they're not your friend. They want to get as much it back as they can in the return. So a lot of times they'll try to get you to spend more on a house. Some of the information may not be correct. We went to purchase a house one time. They said, there's five offers on that house. You want to make sure you put a little extra on it, make sure you get it. I wonder about that, right? So do your research. Uh, understand what it is between a buyer's market and a seller's market. Six months ago, what kind of market did we have here? Six months ago, even a year ago, it was a seller's market. Everybody's looking for homes. What are we in right now? Somewhat of a buyer's market. It's kind of 50-50, right? Some of the prices are starting to drop if they haven't sold right away. Because when you're in a, a seller's market, everything's selling quick. Well, it sits there three, four, five months. There's not many buyers, then you know, it becomes a buyer's market. So you want to be aware of what the buyer's market and the seller's market. Uh, what's the number one most important thing you want to consider when you buy a house? Number one. It's number one, number two, and number three most important thing. Location, location, location. That is so important, huh? That too. That too. That's right. Otherwise, she's going to have you, she's going to have you cleaning it, right? So yeah, location, location, location. You want to make sure it's in a really good location. Uh, and you also don't want to be the most expensive house. You want the other homes to drive your house up, right? Your value your house up. So it's very important you get that. I remember one time I first, 20 something years ago, when I first started getting into real estate, I was looking for a home. And it, was, and it was real pretty. And that's all I was looking at, right? And then my pastor came along and said, hey, you want to avoid that? I, this is where this house is located. This is what's around it. I said, I never thought about that. And instantly I didn't buy that house. I'm glad I didn't, right? And so that was really good that I had him there to, to advise me on that. And I've learned a whole lot since then, right? Uh, you want to do research on sales history, uh, do comparisons. Usually if you go to a neighborhood where people, the homes are not up for sale all the time, that's a good sign. People are staying in those homes longer, that means it's a really good neighborhood. People like it there, right? Uh, what, are, what are the schools like in that, that area? You also want to make sure when you get a loan, what type of loan do you want to get? Of course, 
fixed rate. You want to get a fixed rate, right? With no payoff penalty, right? Or early payoff penalty, right? So that's what you want to get. Uh, sometimes people talk about what, 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 is, what is the better deal? Do you get a better interest rate or a better deal on the home? Which one is more important? Better interest rate or a better deal on the home? That's what everybody thinks. It's actually better to get a better deal on the home. If I can buy a $250,000 house for $185,000 and the interest rate is 8%, I'm still going to buy it. Because I can always renegotiate my interest rate later. But I can't find another house for that, that, prop, for that value. Does that make sense? <laughs> of course, right? Because if that $185,000 I got paid for that house is worth two fifty dollars now and it's worth three hundred and fifty dollars later, I'm not going to pay that much interest. I can always go back and refinance the whole. Yeah, it may cost me two or $3,000, but who cares? I just made eighty-five dollars to $100,000. Does that make sense? So the value of the, the purchase price of the home is way more important than the interest rate. That's what I'm saying. We've been trained to look at the payments every month. We've been trained to look at interest rates, but the value is the most important thing, okay? That's what we want to look at. All right, when we look at tips on buying a home, we want to also take in consideration the extra costs associated with buying that home. Obviously, we know property taxes are atrocious here in Texas, right? Uh, the insurance went up, my insurance went up four or $500 in a year or more. Uh, maintenance and repairs, tools and equipment, all those things that you need when you're a homeowner uh, have a cost. Uh, sometimes if you're not very handy, some people buy what they call a home warranty, right? Maybe some of y'all have those, right? And so we do that as well. Now, let's go ahead and look at when you're financing, paying off your mortgage and things like that, and you're looking at, what, am I going to get a 15-year or a 30-year, right? And uh, which, one you, which one you think is better, a 30-year or a 15-year? Maybe. It depends. Where, where, where are you at with your finances? If I'm buying a home and it's my first home or whatever, I may not want to go with a 15-year because I don't, my job may not be stable. I'm just starting off, whatever. I can go with a 30-year and just pay extra. And if something happens financially, I don't have to make that extra payment. I can control that. Does that make sense? A lot of times when I purchase a home, I buy it uh, out of escrow. I pay my taxes and insurance separate, right? Things like that. Because sometimes they'll, they'll raise your payment a little bit more to have money in surplus to cover the next year's potential increase, right? And you're paying extra on that. So I always keep mine separate. And if an emergency come, I don't have to pay that money right now. I can pay it later, right? They give you to February or end of February or something like that to do that. Does that make sense? Now, if you're in good financial standing, you have a stable job, money and savings, if anything were to happen, you can still pay that house off, you have the cash on hand, and yeah, go with a 15-year mortgage. Our home that we just bought is a 15-year. We'll be done paying for it in two or three years. We're done, right? When my daughter graduates from college, we'll be done paying for the house. So we're, we're at a different place right now, you know? So it just depends on where you're at. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at some of these numbers. So a $100,000 home, again, we're going with simple numbers, at 30 years, at a 7% interest, your payment would be 665. Now, this is not in including property taxes, insurance. It's not including incorporating any of those things, just your payment. Now, that same home in a 15-year, your payment is going to be at $900 a month, a difference in $235 uh, dollars per month. You will save $80,000 over the course of that uh, time. That's quite significant. But again, if you do go with a 30-year, you just pay extra. You do two things when you pay extra. You're paying off the principal, but you're also decreasing the interest rate. When you look at it, it'll still say the same interest rate, but when you pay extra, it's like it's the same as decreasing the interest rate. So that's just a little caveat. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and talk about some of the advantages of paying off your mortgage. You'll go on YouTube and people will say different things. Well, you want to keep a payment and you want, or you want to get rid of a payment. People go back and forth on it. But we all know that at one point we're going to have to retire. And unfortunately, a lot of times we don't get a cost of living adjustment on our pension, our retirement, okay? And I, I don't hear about those too often. But when you pay off your home, obviously it gives you more money that you can keep in your pocket at retirement. That's one less thing you have to worry about, right? And so that's one of the advantages. Uh, it also gives you more money to invest, to save. It gives you more money to invest, things of that nature. And then you're also owning something that continues to do what? To appreciate, to appreciate in value. So it's like money in the bank. 
And so you're saving money also because you're not paying that enemy, number one, you're not paying any interest on that property, right? And then hopefully it's something you can leave behind for those that are, are coming along that your, your uh, descendants, of course, leave them an inheritance. Now let's go ahead and talk about money and marriage. Now this is going to be a very uh, sticky, sticky topic, but we're going to stick to the Bible. All right, so I don't want anybody to leave and say, well, Pastor Will say it. No, 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 no. What does the Bible say? All right, because I've had that happen before. And I've had to actually call a few people and say, well, I just want you to know it wasn't what I said. I showed you from the Bible what it said, all right? So I want to just make that clear. All right, let's go ahead and look at some things, money and marriage. And I hope this is a blessing to you. Uh, a lot of times when people get married or people start off, they, they, they spend, they, 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 they have two incomes and they depend on two incomes. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You never want to depend on two incomes. You always want to live off one income. So when you go to purchase a house, don't say how much my, uh, house can we afford. Always buy something based on one income. Okay? That's very important. All right, it's not wise to buy something based off two incomes because usually, most likely, something's going to happen. If you figure a 30-year mortgage over a 30-year period, something's bound to happen. Not always, but it could. Okay? Money is the number one leading cause of Divorce. Divorce. Some people actually marry for the money. And when the money's gone, they're gone. My wife married me because of the money. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Matter of fact, her dad said, why are you, why are you married a pastor? <laughs> In other words, they don't make a lot of money, right? So it's kind of funny. But anyway, but we know that, you know, as we look at the times today, times have somewhat changed. And uh, we need a little bit more money today to live than we did in the past, Right? If we can live off one income, that's great. We want to be able to do that. But it, it, things have changed. We're, and we do take some of that in consideration. But the best option, though, is to live off one income. That's the best option. Uh, when we decided to, before we even had children, when we decided to homeschool, that was going to be our only option, and which is good. I'm glad that happened. I'm glad we said we we're going to homeschool. And I'm glad that that was the only option. It was going to be just my income, which is not, was not very much. It's funny because when you start making a little bit more later, you look back and say, how do we do that? And I can give you the answer, it was my wife. That's how we did it. So, all right. Titus 2 is what we're going to look at this morning. Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5. This is going to be our text, so make sure you keep your finger or your little uh, bookmark there. That's where we're going to stay. And that's going to be our base scripture for what we're going to cover uh, for, for most of what we got left here this morning. Titus chapter 2, look at it, verse 3 through 5. Let's see what it says here. It says that the age women likewise... Now, when I speak here in the church, I'll say, I'll never say old, I say older, right? Sounds better, doesn't it? But the Bible says aged. Maybe I'll start using that, I don't know. But it says age, right? However you want to determine that. In some cultures, I'm thinking of the Mormon culture, it's if you're 21, you're an elder, <laughs> right? But age here could be, I mean, you know, 40, whatever the case may be. But it says the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior, as, yep, you got to behave, as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of what? Good things, right? So, so far we're looking at what the responsibility of a mother, of a, of a woman maybe in the church, uh, could be a widow, whoever. Anybody who's older, it, it fits here. It goes in verse 4, it says that they may teach the who, folks? Young women to be sober. Now, I want you to look at this now. We're talking about marriage and family, but who is the focus on? The wife, the woman, right? Why is that? Because no matter what the, the Bible says, she's truly the boss, right? <laughs> okay, That's really what it boils down to. The Bible says the, the, the man, is, the husband is the head, but the wife is the neck that turns the head, right? You heard that one? So really, really what it's saying is even though the, the husband is the leader, the wife bears a great responsibility. She's what, brings, she's what makes everything fit together. Maybe you were there one time when your grandmother passed away. Remember that? When my grandmother passed away, our family fell apart because she was that glue that held us together. She was the best cook. She was the most lovable, right? Uh, she was the most considerate. And when she passed away, it's like kind of like things fell apart, right? And so we know that the, the wives bear a huge responsibility. So it goes on and says before that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Also speaks to her knowledge that she's gained over time as she's had a longer time to live. How about that? 
Verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So let's go ahead and break this down. We're going to look at several things this morning. And so it mentions the older women. How are they to teach? Two ways they're to teach, and it mentions it here. First of all, by example. We talked about this before. The number one method of teaching, even in a classroom, is by modeling. When you model something, get, people get it a whole lot faster. That's why we watch, guess what, folks, YouTube videos. I was putting some electrical together, and I, my wife always said, don't do electrical. But I was desperate, and I had to get it done, right? And there was this big spark. Well, that spark's telling you there's something wrong. I was glad it didn't spark me, amen? My hair would be like this this morning. But anyway, and uh, so I went back, and I looked at the YouTube video, and within 15 seconds, I automatically knew what I did wrong because I could see it. All I do is take the wire on this side and put it on the other side. Problem solved. I felt so accomplished, right? And so it's by example. The, the other way that they teach is by exhortation, encouragement, right? So what are they to teach? Let's go ahead and look at what the verse said. What are they to teach? The first thing they are to teach younger women is to be disciplined, right? So the word they use here is sober. Discipline, sober, to be sober. We see that in verse 3 and we see it in verse 4. The word means to be of sound mind, to be correct. Uh, it means to recall to the senses. In other words, we're to teach our younger ones to have a biblical worldview, to look at everything. We got to be careful that we don't let the world infiltrate how we run our family and our home. If we let the commercials and movies and TVs and the social influence get a hold of our hearts, we will do things the way the world does it. And guess what? It doesn't end too well. We must stay focused on what God says because God doesn't change, folks. He doesn't. We got to stay focused on the word of God. So the first thing our older women are to teach our young women in the church, in the home, is to be disciplined, to be sober, have the right mind, a sound mind. The second thing we must teach them is not only to be disciplined, but to be devoted, to be devoted. Look at verse 4, to be devoted. We see that there. Devoted to who? Who does it say here to be devoted to? To their families. Your family is your what, folks? Your first ministry. Billy Sunday, I don't know if you heard of him, was a great preacher, great evangelist, but he wasn't the greatest father because he was never around. He was always preaching to other people, going on crusades, and he never spent time with his family. And if you read about his family, it was a disaster. And so our family is our first ministry. So who does it start with? Who's number uno in the family? The husband, not your children, not your grandchildren, but your husband is your first priority. So you're to teach them to be devoted to their husbands, to love their husband. The word is philandros, which means an affectionate love. It's only found here in the New Testament. So we're to teach them to learn to love their husbands, to make love preeminent in their home, to make love prevalent in their home. Very important. Because we know that love is a remedy when all this fails. When you're going through hard times, the love of Jesus Christ and the love of each other is what's going to hold that family together. And you're going to go through some tough times in the home. And that's what holds you together. And so always remember, your husband comes before the children because the children won't always be around. And so that's the first love. He's the head of the home. He's the one that's accountable before God. And so you're set to the example for the future generation. As you're modeling that in the home of loving your husband, your children are also watching you, right? They're learning by you modeling that behavior. And so you're, as the older, you're teaching the, the younger. And so who else are we to love other than our husband? We're to love who? Our children. Now, this is a commandment, not an emotion. All right. It's important to remember that because sometimes we get upset with our children. So God is commanding us, no matter what, you love your children. Because what are you doing when you love your children? You're teaching them about who? The love of Christ. The love of Christ. They need to see it in you first. When, as I do ministry, yesterday I had a chance to go over to Utah V and minister to several college students over there. And I love doing that. And, man, they had so many questions to ask me about my life and about life itself and about the Bible and I was so happy and excited to pass on my knowledge to them and to be able to be a help to them. And I had one girl come to me and say, you know what? I decided I'm going to surrender to ministry. I thought, well, what a blessing. If I can encourage you to do that, what a blessing. And so she'll be going off to a Christian camp this year, and she'll be serving in the summer camp. And she's raising funds. And I, was, I said, well, if you need money later on, let me know, and we'll figure out how to get it to you. But I love encouraging young people, teaching the younger people uh, these things that we're looking at right here. Amen? Uh, that's such a blessing to be able to do that. And so it's a commandment, not an emotion, to love them. Uh, equally, not have favorites, right? We see in the Bible what happens when you have favorites, right? Not to have favorites, love them equally and completely. Love them completely, because that's the way God loves us. And then we see not only do we see discipline and devoted, but we see to teach them to be discreet. Look at verse 5. Sensible and self-controlled. 
uh, don't, don't overindulge. I talked to a parent not too long ago, and he says, man, I, I messed up. I said, what do you mean you messed up? He says, man, I, I, I tried to do everything for them because I didn't want them to grow up the way I did. I, and he says, I think I overdid it. I said, yeah, you did. You made it a little too easy for them, <laughs> right? You, you need to put, give them some chores. You need to get them. Yeah, you, you may be too late. I don't know. But you overindulge. Don't overindulge, right? But also don't overdiscipline. That make sense? You say, well, what is the balance? I don't know. You have to figure it out. Every kid is different. You can't discipline one kid, kid number one, the way you discipline kid number two. Because kid number two may have a thicker skull, all right, and a tougher behind, right? So we, we, it's different. So when I say love them equally, that includes the discipline, right? Both sides. Uh, don't give them empty threats. Don't give them empty threats. Don't, don't tell them you're going to do something that you know you're not going to follow up with or it's impossible to follow up with. If you say, hey, you're grounded for, for a whole month and you got to stay in your room and eat whatever, right? <laughs> Ramen noodles, whatever you want to give them, right? Bread and bologna, I don't know. Uh, is that feasible? Can you actually follow through on that, right? So make sure when you do it, you're consistent, you follow through, because if you don't, they're taking the middle note of that. And they say, well, how do I get what I want from my parents? They, they have that. They keep that log there. You don't see it. They don't write it down anywhere, but it's there. They're keeping track. So be consistent. Don't give empty threats. And then don't break promises. When you promise something, you follow through. Don't break those because it causes resentment in their hearts, right? So you follow through on those promises. And don't play favorites. Don't play favorites, okay? So number one, we're teaching them to be disciplined. We're teaching them to be devoted. Number three, we're teaching them to be what? Discreet. And then number four, we're teaching them to be decent. Don't you love a decent young person that's respectful? We're teaching them to be decent young people. Okay? Look at verse five. The word used here for decent is chaste. It means pure and immaculate, free from carnality, right? From worldliness. In today's society, we face a rabid influction of fornication and pornography. We really do parading homosexuals and demanding feminists. Feminism is the, the woke, we call it the woke generation crowd today. And that's really what we've been infiltrated with in our public schools and everywhere around us. And so we're living in what we call the age of new morality. They think they're right when they're oh so wrong. And they're promoting this propaganda to everywhere. And so they teach relativism and humanism. And it's really what we would consider a progressive movement, a progressive movement. And it is openly accepted by schools and media. Now, remember, other than you outside the home, if you don't have that influence on your child, guess who becomes their great influence? Their school teacher or the professor in the secular college. That's who they begin to look up to. So instead of looking up to mom and dad, because we missed that opportunity to impact them, they start looking up to people who are educated in the world system. That's where we got to be careful. We don't want to do that, have that happen. And so schools and media and the courts and often the government take on this same philosophy. So we got to be careful that we train our young people against that. Porn, porn, pornographic books, child molestation, syndicated crime, indulgence in drugs, and the senseless pursuit of the demon-haunted occult world characterizes our society today. We have banished the Bible from classroom, and we've taken down the Ten Commandments from the courtrooms. Hopefully one day we get that back. I've been hearing there's a, there's a law that passed, that we may do that, and I hope we do, because they need to know where thus saith the Lord what it means, right? Where our rules stem for, from, our country was founded on. And so there's a huge pressure for our young ladies to conform in their dress, in their decisions, and in their duties to their family because the world around them is pressing them into their mold, as Romans talks about. And so we need to fight for our Christian heritage in our homes. The older, the Bible says here, needs to teach the who? The younger, the younger, to counterbalance the influence that we see in the world. Do we see that this morning? We gotta be ready to teach. So when we have our Sunday school teachers out there teaching our young children, that's exactly what they're doing. When you see one of our young ladies in the church and you put your arm around, hey, I wanna have you over for dinner. That's what you're mentoring, you're modeling, you're doing what the Bible teaches to do. And that's why the church is so important because we need all of us to come alongside our families, pass on our knowledge and teach them. We do it as a team. Don't try to live your life outside the church. You won't make it. God has planted the church here for that purpose. Does that make sense this morning? I think about Ruth and Naomi. You remember them? Uh, you know, the story goes that she had lost her husband, right? And then she followed Naomi. She, she decided not to go back to her country. 
uh, Moab, go with Naomi. And she said, your God will be what? My God. And so she modeled to her. She mentored that younger lady. And when Boaz saw her, guess what? He said, this here is a virtuous woman. You want to know why she was a virtuous woman? Because of the influence of Naomi on her life. You see, our older ladies are to teach our younger women. Our mothers are to teach our daughters. This is so vital. It's so important that we get this this morning. And I know what you're thinking. Easier said than done. I get it. But we got God's help. Amen? We got people here that can help. And then fifthly, we need to teach them to be domesticated. Look at verse 5. And this is where we probably get the most kickback from the world. Times have changed, Pastor. You don't understand. Well, yeah, I do understand times have changed. I see it every day. I understand. But what does God say? Right? The Bible uses the word here, keepers at home. Today's language, we would say workers at home. That's what we say, workers at home, right? And so they're to be guardians of the home, in other words. And so women get a lot of enormous pressure from society when it comes to this, right? A lot of pressure. Uh, a lot of times they get it from the in-laws and family against this. Try to tell you how to raise your children. They do that. Anybody got family like that? Uh, I know some that don't even have children and they try to tell you how to raise your children. Hey, man, how about that one? Today, we see women that are discontented and independent of their husbands. They're doing their own thing, right? It's not a family unit. Uh, I, I'll be very careful when you go into the business industry and the wife decides to work outside the home. It's very important that we understand that when you work outside the home as a wife, you better be very particular about what type of job that you get. If you're going into the business structure or anything that deals with something like that, and you got a, a male boss that says, hey, uh, today you're not going home at 5 o'clock. You need to stay till 7 o'clock. And you stay to 7. Now you got another man telling you what to do. You can't go home to your children. Be careful about what kind of job you choose. That, that's my advice. You do what you want, right? But be careful. The Bible says here, if we look at the text, it says being obedient to your own husbands. Now we're going to talk about what that means. Can we see that? We think, oh. You mean he bosses me around? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're going to talk about that in a moment because I know that's what you're thinking, right? We find that many children have strayed because mom is not available in those important hours. I've done my research and I've seen that between the hours of 4 and 7 o'clock is when kids get in the most trouble. You say, what time is that? That's after school when daddy or mom is not home. And that's when they get in the most trouble. And so the Bible is our highest source of wisdom because it's based on the highest wisdom. And so we need to get our, our information from there. So it's the most important, and I'll say this, more important than being the president, really more important than being a pastor is being a mother. It's the highest and most honorable position that you can have is to be a mother. Because every mother that takes that post has the first impact on their children and our children have an impact on society. Now, I'll say this. If we can do everything right, folks, we can do everything right, and guess what? Our kids can still, what? Make their own decision, right? But can I give you a little word of encouragement this morning? Your church is praying for you if that's your case. Your church loves you, that we're praying for you, and God is still working. He's still their Heavenly Father, amen? And He's still working in their hearts. All we need to do is continue to love on them, encourage them without compromise, right? We don't compromise with them. But we love on them. I was talking to a young man the other day. And he was talking about how, man, I, 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 matter of fact, I'll just tell you who it is. It's Leo. If you don't know Leo, he's the guy with the big, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, what do you call those guys on TV from Louisiana? What's their name? Duck Dynasty. There you go. Those guys, he got one of those kind of beards, right? I give him a hard time about that because I can't grow a beard. But anyway, and uh, he, got, he got saved last Sunday after the Sunday service. And that's why I had him, I had him for lunch. And, uh, and we were talking, he was saying, you know what, Pastor? He said, one of the things that I regret is the way I treated my mother. He says, I want to do right by her now. He says, you know, when you were preaching last Sunday, he said, God got a hold of my heart. And he said, my, 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 my uh, mom had told me about Christ, and I knew. But he said, that day when you preached about Christ's suffering, he said, it was the time. I just needed to do it. I needed to just get it over with, right? That's the way he put it. And of course, it just kind of stirred my heart. But uh, he was sharing his heart with me. He was pouring his heart out. He was just basically saying, you know what? I, I did some wrong things. I treated my mom badly. He says, but man, in other words, he came to Christ. And so if you have anybody, your grandchildren and children, God's still in control, amen? God's still in control. Continue to encourage them. Was that an encouragement to you? I hope it was. I hope it is. God is still in control. 
And then so we're to teach them to be guardians of the home. The Bible says workers at home, guardians of the home. And then to be good, the Bible says here, benefit to their family. It means to be a useful and agreeable and joyful. And then they're to be guided by their husbands. And so that's what it means when it says be obedient to the husbands. Be guided by their husbands, right? Uh, uh, husbands, we're men. You know, even when it comes to my daughter, I'll tell my daughter, hey, uh, I'm, I'm a boy, so I know how boys operate, right? Who better to know than a dad how boys operate? And I, and I educate on that. This is how boys think. This is how boys, you know, this is what they do. And so we have those kind of discussions. And so when we look at the words, be obedient to your husbands or guided by your husband, it's a military term that means to be in subjection. We all know that when we go to battle and we're on the, on the battlefield, if any soldier decides to rebel against the one in charge, he's putting his what at risk, his life at risk. When you decide that you're going to buck against the system that God created, you're putting your family at risk. Does that make sense this morning? You say, well, you don't know my husband. He's not a very good leader. Well, leave that to God. God will work that out. You just do what the Bible says. God can do a much better job than you can. Maybe you tried that. Did it work out? I'm pretty sure it didn't work out too well. Let God work on him and you focus on what God has asked you to do. Amen? God is a God of order. Is he not? God is a God of order. He has order in the home. He has an order in the state. He has an order in the church. It's all in the word of God. And it lines of authority are clearly drawn here in the word of God. Don't try to make a different plan. Follow God's plan. And then lastly, we see defenders. Defenders. Look at verse 5. The last part of verse 5. It says, so the word of God, we do all these things. We teach our young women all these things so that the ultimate price that we get to see, the, the value of it is this. So the word of God is not blasphemed. If you know Christ, no one in this room wants to see anybody ridicule their God. Is that not true? When somebody says something about my God, I get upset about it. And so that's the ultimate reason. We want to make sure that when people come to our home and people look at our church, that they see that things are done and decently in order. We're following the word of God. That's what makes us peculiar to the world. We're doing it differently than the world does it. And so teaching them to obey the word so that the world will not ridicule the cause of Christ or give them an excuse to defame the word of God. We're not to give them that excuse. We're to do things according to the Bible. And so when God's works, word speaks to an issue, be it a spiritual issue, be it a, a social or scientific or even a, a secular issue that we need to perk up and listen to what God has to say. And that's really what we want to be able to do. It speaks with the highest authority. It speaks with unerring wisdom and with unfailing love. Its principles must be accepted. Its precept must be obeyed and its promises must be believed. And so as we look at marriage and we look at money, how does this apply? When we look at marriage, we find there can actually be some serious financial problems in a marriage. And one of the areas where it becomes an issue is that if we lack compatibility when it comes to the area of finances. Now, I've always said that typically in a marriage, there's always one that's more spontaneous and the one that's more conservative. How do we get two people that are totally opposite, male, female, to become one, right? And to live as one. It's almost impossible. You're right. It is impossible unless you put God at the center of it. Unless you do things according to not your way, but God's way. Otherwise, it is very impossible. It really is. So, sometimes in marriage, we have one that's a saver and one that's a spender. I'll let y'all figure out who that is, all right? But after the service, please. Amen. Uh, sometimes there's one that thinks about today, and there's one who thinks about the future. There's one that wants to do things with credit, and there's one that actually wants to be more patient and plan when they buy things, right? That's what we have. Every time the squirrel puts away a nut, when he returns with another one, the other one is gone. If that's happening in your marriage, that's not good, right? We need to be on the same page. And so we would consider some of the typical financial issues couples face and some practical guidelines for relieving stress over financial matters. And so we're going to look at planning, planning. Again, if you have grandchildren, this applies as well. Now, I'm pretty sure this is from a few years ago, but I'm pretty sure the total is a lot more than this. I think it's closer to like half a million to a million in that range now when you talk about raising a children. But these are some of the things that we can look at anyway. Uh, housing and transportation. How many of y'all have been a taxi? You been there? I remember one time, I, one of my kids, I'm not going to say who it was, but they tried to sit in the back seat. And then they crossed their legs in the back seat. I thought, if you don't get your, your rear end in the front seat, you know, I'm not a taxi. But 
housing and transportation, all those things cost, right? You have to buy a home with enough bedrooms to fit them in and all those kind of things. Uh, we think about child care and education. Uh, we chose to put our kids in private school. Well, we, we had to pay for that, right? Uh, there's other costs that come even in public school. There's other costs. Well, they do sports. That in itself is a cost, right? Uh, those things. And we think about education. We think about uh, child care. We think about food. Uh, we think about clothing and all those other things that we take care of. Health care. So many things that we have to take care of. Some of us, even for health care, uh, I know the government says up until they're age 26, so some of you may even still have your kids or grandkids, I don't know, on your health care. But we need to plan for children, right? We need to prepare because God commands to take care of the family. First Timothy 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And so this is a way that we show our faith is by taking care of our families, right? Uh, what about children who are born out of wedlock? Does that happen sometimes? Absolutely. Sometimes that happens. You may have a son or daughter that, unfortunately, they got pregnant outside of marriage. That could happen. It could present un unexpected problems and questions arise. If the mother is a teenager, then here are some questions. Will they be able to complete their education? That's very valuable. We showed you statistics not too long ago about people who have degrees make a little bit more income, right? Uh, how would they provide for their, their child? How would they provide for themselves? These are questions that begin to arise. Oftentimes, others have to take care of their more irresponsibility. Sometimes the parents and the grandparents have to come in and help, okay? That's we do what we have to do, right? Uh, sometimes the government has to come in and help. But these are things that we think about. If there are adults, how will they provide a stable home environment? How will they provide for their financial needs? God commands us, first of all, not to commit fornication because it prevents all these problems. But sometimes it happens. But that's why the commandment is here, right? And so that's why we do the best that we can. And so thus financial issues that accompany uh, these type of lifestyles can be eliminated if we follow God's word. Uh, I've talked before about the stats on those who are in prison are alarming. When you consider those in prison, 85% of prison inmates are born out of wedlock. That's amazing when you look at it. That's staggering. That shows how important it is doing God's way is important. And raising our children to live God's way is so important because guess what? It works. Statistics prove that it works. Does that make sense this morning? We find that even married couples should plan to have children. It's wise to complete their education. And it's wise to complete your education, but not only your education, but it's wise to complete your wedding debt-free. We see so many young people want to get married. They want to have these elaborate weddings. And really and truly, it's not even for them. It's for everybody else. And half of the people don't even give a hill of beans, right? And we're doing all this stuff, and we're getting in all this debt and not realizing that it's going to create a problem in our marriage from the very beginning. Okay? From the very beginning, we need to do everything within our means. Yeah, you want to do something nice. I get that. But we want to be careful about that. Caring for children. Often a problem for two-income families. Uh, will it be a family member that will take care of the child if both parents are working? Will it be a burden to them? I already told my kids that I don't mind watching the kids, but it won't be every day. <laughs> It'll be, it will be when I feel like it. <laughs> Amen? Will it be strangers that will be taking care of those kids? So these are all things to think about if we're going to have two people working outside the home. Often when we take a look at the picture, when we look at the husband working outside the home and the wife working outside the home, both doing that, we find there's not much of a financial difference because when you think about the money you're going to spend on daycare, uh, transportation, uh, most of the time you're not going to be able to eat at home. If, you're, if the wife is tired, she's not going to feel like cooking three meals a day or at least one meal a day, whatever the case may be. Uh, you think about the additional clothing you've got to buy, and there's so many things you can add to this list of do the math and does it really make sense for both of them to work outside the home? What, how is it advantageous? How is it disadvantageous? disadvantage to our home, to our family. Does that make sense? And so in planning, you could also consider working from home. I know a young lady who uh, went and got training to, to be a, a website designer, and when she got married, she was able to create websites from home and be at home, and she could do it at her own leisure. She took on jobs that she had time, right? Uh, so working from home is a great opportunity to take advantage of technology today. Uh, the simplest and best solution is parents to care for and teach their children, right? Uh, who would you rather have teaching your kids, you or somebody else? Good, fair question. Ask. Now, you may, now, I know there's, there's little details that go into this. Maybe your kid has a learning disability or, or some special need. Those are, those are exceptions, right? Those are things where, yeah, you want to pull in some support at some point. Maybe you can start off when they're little, helping them with third things, educating yourself, whatever the case may be. But at some point, you may have to get some outside help. At some point, you may have to send them to a Christian school. That's for you to decide as a family. But what I'm giving you is what's best, right? 
but you have to determine what works best for your family. Proverbs 1.8, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. So Proverbs talk about passing on wisdom and that needs to come from mom and dad, not from the professor, right? And so we all know that sometimes things happen. We talked about earlier having a kid out of wedlock. Like single parents, for single parents, this can be a real challenge. And we, and as your church and as your church family, we understand that. And we stand behind our single uh, uh, parents. And we try to encourage them and support them as best we can. And then we think about sharing resources. When you get married, this is one of the hardest things for me. When I got married, I realized how selfish I really was. When I ordered fries, she said she didn't want anything. She started taking mine. I realized I had a problem. <laughs> All right. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now that sounds so simple to us. But you know how many problems I've had in biblical counseling with families that don't get this simple plan? I'm serious. They don't get it. And, it, and, it, and it's right here. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And sometimes we don't understand this and we get into this vicious cycle. But it says right here that wives are to submit to their husbands, but also husbands are supposed to love their wives. If husbands, you're not loving your wives, it's going to make it awfully hard for them to submit to you. They're going to see you as a big ogre, right? So we're to love on them. If we treat them like a queen, they'll treat us like a king. That's the principle that we see here. And so there's no room for selfishness in a loving relationship that God desires every couple to experience. We find that too often one puts personal interests before the needs of their family and arguments on how to spend any additional money begins to take place. So we're going to look at some scripture here in a moment and see what we need to do in those situations. But the most important thing is we need to be rich toward God. That's the most important thing. Money is one thing, but if we're not rich toward God, money doesn't matter. Does that make sense? To be rich toward God. God's instructions must be our highest priorities. Couples who keep biblical principles in mind make it easier to share their resources together. And so how are we to work together? What does the Bible say about working together? Who should handle the finances? Who can answer that? Who should handle the finances in your home? The one who likes to do it. Okay. Well, in society's past, in society's past, it's been customary for the man to take care of a lot of things, right? But because the Bible says he's a leader in Ephesians 5.23. But we know that wives can contribute. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us. If you look at Proverbs 31, we look at the, the virtuous woman. Read all those things it says about that virtuous woman. She does a whole lot more than the guy does, right? <laughs> so we know that she's capable. We know that this could be applied here. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 that she had financial wisdom and skills to the family economy. That's really what the virtuous woman was. That's what she did. So she has tremendous value for the family. Uh, many times the wife has a greater financial budget, uh, budgeting skills than, than the husband does. And so that's why the Bible always tells us to take note of that and always make decisions with our wives in mind. You say, where does it say that in the Bible? Glad you asked. We're going to see it right here. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. You say, where does it say we need to look to our wives? Well, I'm going to show you. Look at verse 3, chapter 3. Look at verse 1 through 7 real quickly. It says, likewise, you, likewise, you wives, be in sub subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without word, be won by the conversations or lifestyle, that word means, of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. In other words, it's saying, this is how important a wife is. They're so important that God says, if you know Christ, that you're to still submit to him, you're still to be loving to him no matter what he is like. He can be an alcoholic. It doesn't matter. You treat him as though he's the main squeeze in your life, right? And God says, as you're doing that, I will work in his heart to bring him to where he needs to be. That's what it teaches here. A lot of times I do marriage counseling. They say, well, he, he won't do this, and he won't be responsible, enough, and I have to go and fix this. And I, well, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Let God get a hold of him. He said, but if I do that, we won't have anything. Well, God will work on that person. You just do your best to love on him and do what you're supposed to do, and God will work on it. That's hard to do. Is that not? Very hard to do. But God promises here. Look what it says. He says, while they behold your chase, we talked about that word chase, decent conversation coupled with fear. As they see that God is real, living in your life, that you're, being, you're loving them, 
God begins to work in their heart. That's what it's saying here. It says he begins to put fear in their heart. Whose adorning, let it be not of the outward adorning of the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold or the putting on the pair. In other words, don't be that wife that worries so much about how you look on the outward. You should, by the way, but that should not be your primary focus because a lot of wives are like that. Their primary focus is they, they worry about what everybody else thinks about them, but they don't think about what their family thinks about them, right? And it's all about how they look. And everything's about that. It's selfish, right? God says, don't let it be that way. It says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God. So that's what it boils down to. We're trusting in God. We're not doing what the way the world does it. We're trusting in God. Adorn themselves being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. Now, my wife doesn't call me Lord. That would be pretty cool, though, right? We're talking about the hard attitude here, though. Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, look what it says here. Here's the point that I want to get to that I was talking about, alluded to earlier. It says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, speaking of his wives, according to what, folks? Knowledge. Giving what? Honor unto your wife. Okay? As unto the weaker vessel. Now, we see that word weaker vessel. Right? It's speaking of physically, but it also can apply emotionally. We're different emotionally. We just are. I'm not going to defend that. We just are. If, if we were the same emotionally, you wouldn't be a woman. We wouldn't be a man. Right? So we don't need to argue about that. That's what it says here. It says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And so we're a team. We're working together. So even though you're the leader, God's going to hold you accountable as a husband. But you need to make sure that you listen to your wise, very wise wife. If, like me, I have a son and a daughter, I can tell you, I wanted a son first when my daughter was born. I was, after a while, I realized how smart she was. I'm like, I'm glad. Amen? So in other words, our wives are very wise. They're very wise, even from the beginning. And so God's principle is to work as a what? A team. Y'all get that? To work as a team. We each have a role. And so when it comes to our finances, that's in care. And then lastly this morning, I want to end with this, teaching your children finances, your grandchildren finances. Psalms 127, verse 3, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. What a wonderful privilege it is to raise the next generation. As I sat there speaking to all those UTRGV students, and they were asking me all these personal questions and things that they were struggling, anxiety, depression, all these things, and able to give them some things from the Word of God that they can lean on, and saw their faces kind of shine and lighten up and be encouraged in the things of God. I, I see this principle right here. What a wonderful privilege it is to have the opportunity to raise up young people. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a VBS out here. I pray you be involved in that because it's a great opportunity to see our church get out into the community and be a blessing. And one of my, one of my, one of my I guess, priorities is to make sure that people understand that the Bible has every answer that we need in life. Every time I preach the Word of God, I want people to see the wisdom of God in the Word of God. 3,000 years ago, God rescued Israel from Egypt. And when he rescued them, he was interested in both the adults, but also the children when he rescued them. He wanted Israel to prosper in the land for many generations. And so God always has a heart for children. And so we want to be able to teach our children finances. And we find that he repeatedly told the Israelites to teach your children over and over again, to teach your children. And so this includes the area of finances. Now, we're going to go look at these verses. I want you to do these at home. But in Deuteronomy 4, 9 and 10 and 40, when you get an opportunity to read that, but it talks about teaching their children over and over in the Old Testament. Uh, in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, verse 29, chapter 6, it talks about teaching children. Deuteronomy chapter 11 is teaching children. By the way, the book of Deuteronomy is called the second law. You say, why is that? Because remember, God destroyed a whole generation because they were disobedient, raised up that new generation, and he wanted them to learn his laws all over again. That's how important they were. And so we're to do the same, right, to teach our children. And so the next question as we begin to close, what age should we begin to teach our children about finances? What age do we begin doing that? Well, there is no certain age, right? As soon as they begin to use money. And really before they begin asking you for it, amen? Because once they start asking you for it, it's almost too late because they don't even really understand the value of it and they expect you just to give it to them. So it's really good to start real early, real young, when they're real young. I remember one time my son, I'm always embarrassed, and I said, I'm so sad he's a preacher's daughter, or preacher's son, I'm sorry. But uh, I have to apologize to him all the time. But anyway, 
uh, I remember one time he gave my wife, he had this allowance and he gave my wife, uh, I think it was like $35 or something, which is a lot of money for a little kid. And he gave it to her for Mother's Day. He said, Mom, here you go. Why don't you go out to the mall and buy you something nice? And so, of course, my wife took off and they, they took off and they went wherever they went. My daughter went, and went out and came back home about three or four hours later. And she came in the door and he went up to her and says, Mom, did you bring the rest of my money back? <laughs> oh, we laughed so hard about that. <laughs> But you know what? When we turn on TV, uh, it's always marketing and commercials. They're also marketing to our children, are they not? They put those toys on there and all those stuff. So they need to learn about money because even commercials understand that we're, we're teaching kids about spending money, right? And so we need to teach them that. And so let's talk about some of these things. Money to work with parents must be willing to take the necessary time to teach them and then give them opportunities to earn money on their own. Uh, it was funny because I had a guy knock on my door, a 19-year-old kid who was selling pest control service. And he knocked on my door. And we just got to talking. I talked to everybody that comes to my door. And, uh, and so he said, you know, one of the things my parents taught me is not to give me an allowance. He said, because getting an allowance is like getting a welfare check. <laughs> I thought, man, you know what? You're right. So we, we stopped that. <laughs> I learned it from a 19-year-old kid. How about that? And, uh, and so what we do is they want money. Okay, you can wash my truck. Then you can do this, the extra things, not the things that are their chores. That you don't get paid for. That's why we feed you, right? <laughs> but if you want extra money, you have to do extra things. So I hear my daughter laughing over there. Help them to keep it, their money in a safe place. I remember the first year we gave our kids went to camp, they were probably eight years old or whatever they were, and we gave them money, and, they, and then I get a phone call. Dad, I lost my money. <laughs> well, too bad. <laughs> too bad, too sad. Do they feed you three meals a day? Yeah, well, that's all you're going to get. When you go to the snack shop, you're going to just open up the bag, I guess, because we're not giving you any more money. So what are we teaching them? That you need to keep up with your money. So a lot of times I give money, I just put it wherever. Put it in this, you know, no, get, I bought my son a wallet. Here's a wallet. You put your money in your wallet, and you put it in your front pocket, right? So we teach them to put it away in a safe place. Uh, sometimes we do with the thing in the old days, we give them a piggy bank. How about that? And then we find out that the money they put in there is still not there, so we put put it in a way they had to break it to get the money out. Remember that? And so they can't go in there and steal the money out to go buy candy or whatever the case may be. And then we assist them on receiving income and how to put some aside, how to save. And they have these little neat little contraptions. Y'all probably saw them where it has like a store, a bank, and whatever, and you can put the money in this slot. You put spending money in this one, uh, your savings here, and then you're giving to the church here kind of thing. They have those things they sell. That's a good tool to use if you want to teach them those principles. But the key is teaching them that when we work, it brings reward. That's what we want them to teach them. We don't want to ever teach them that the world just gives me. The whole principle is you want to teach them to work for reward. Okay? That's the key. Financial planning. Lay a foundation for children to budget. Help them evaluate and plan for purchasing. Make a list of things that they want to purchase. A lot of times you make it, put it in writing, and they have all these unrealistic things. They have no idea what they cost. I remember one time we took a trip. This was a few years back, and I was going to buy a car. And uh, I took my son with me, went up to Dallas. You know, we used to get better deals in Dallas back in the day. And we went up to Dallas, and uh, he had a dollar. I think my mom had given him a dollar. And this was probably five, ten years ago. I don't know. And, man, that dollar was burning a hole in his pocket. He had to spend that dollar on that trip. And, man, everywhere we stopped, he was trying to spend that dollar, but then he soon realized, Dad, I can't get nothing for a dollar. So this whole trip up there, he couldn't spend it. On the way back, he said, Dad, we got to go to the dollar store. Now you go to the dollar store and nothing's a dollar. Hey, man. They need to change the name. But, but what was he learning? The value of money. Amen? Those are great lessons. And so we got to lay the foundation for our children to budget, help them evaluate and plan their purchasing. A lot of times we would, uh, we, I remember that not to, even too long ago, probably about six months ago, we were out at a store, and my son said, oh, these shoes, because he's got big feet like I do. And we're, it's hard for him to find shoes. And, he, and these shoes were and they weren't, they were a good price, but he only had so much money. If he bought those shoes, he would have only so much left. And I says, well, I'll tell you what, son. And he, oh, here's the other thing they do. They don't bring their money with them. Conveniently, they don't have their money with them. You ever been through that one? Oh, I left my money at home. Well, too bad for you. No sympathy for me, right? And so that's what he had done. He had left his money at home. I said, okay, today's Saturday. After church Sunday, we'll go by here. And if you still want to buy those shoes, you can buy them. I'm fine with it, Okay. Well, how about the next day? He didn't even bring it up, so we didn't go, right? So those, those are just principles that we employ just to get them to start. Don't just buy. Think about, it's a good, yeah, it's a good deal, but it doesn't mean you got to buy it. If you're not going to use it, you don't need it. It's a waste of money, right? Does that make sense? So those are the principles. Sometimes they'll, 
I'll say, okay, this is what I can give you, but if you want this, and you need to save for that. You want, a, you want a blouse that costs, you know, $60, I'll give you 30 This is what I can afford. You save for the other 30 if you really want it. And oftentimes, they'll buy the cheap one. They'll go find one at the thrift store, whatever. They figure that out. It doesn't mean because we have the money, we got to give it to them. That's not wise. Because they're not learning anything. We're just giving it to them. You say, well, God's blessed me, Pastor, and I have it to give. So what? Don't just give. What are you teaching them? Right? Again, that applies to situations. It can be situational. But that's what the, the, the main theme is. It's very common for kids to want something they can't afford because they don't know the value of money yet, right? They're still learning it. And so well, how we address that, we decline lovingly. I like to say that. We decline lovingly with a smile on our face. I'm sorry, but we cannot get that, right? You do it lovingly. And so it's better for them to learn early. A lot of times, I, you know, I was talking to my mom. I was telling somebody, I was talking to my mom about a situation with my, my daughter, and I said, man, I felt so bad to do what I did. And then my mom said, well, you shouldn't feel bad. I said, but I do. I'm a dad. I feel bad. Didn't you feel bad? No, she probably did. I don't know. But I said, no, I feel bad. And I said, I said but I'm not going to do it because I know it's the right thing to do. Sometimes we're not going to feel so good when we have to do that. It doesn't feel good when we tell our kids no. Do you agree? It hurts to say no sometimes. But sometimes we need to do that. And so they need to understand there's consequences. You don't want them to grow up and be an adult and spend all their money on something they don't need or waste their money and they're coming to ask you for money, right? Like you're the bank. Experience is an effective teacher. Older children, when it comes to purchasing, give them responsibility to purchase personal items. Give them a budget amount. Let them decide what they want to buy based on your guidelines. How much to spend on each item. If they spend unwisely, they'll realize they're limited. For example, they need, a, they need to get something for choir. They got choir, and they need to dress a certain way. You say, well, here's $100, go figure it out. Well, if they want to go and get an $80 shirt, they're going to realize I only have $20 left to get my pants, <laughs> right? So they need to make those decisions early. You limit them what they can buy, you give it to them, and then let them figure it out. That's a great wage for them to learn. And we find that our kids are going to take it back, buy something cheaper, and, get, and be able to get everything. You're teaching them to bargain shop. You're teaching them to understand that things cost money. Does that make sense this morning? And so we do those things. Let them live with the consequences if they make the bad decisions rather than bailing them out. And deny them the opportunity to learn from the consequences. Don't bail them out. Don't bail them out. When it comes to older children saving money, we need to teach them the importance of saving money. Open a savings account. See how interest works. Set aside money for emergency. It's so neat to be able to open up an account and let them see how interest works and see their money improving. If you've got a life policy you put out on your kids, let them see that, how it's increasing in that policy or whatever you have. Let them see that. Uh, teach them how to use credit wisely. Saving for retirement. All those things. Uh, my first pastor, I remember he, his son was, I think, 16 when he started a lawn service, and he went and bought some property. It was a $200 payment a month. He was paying on that $200. He was making enough to pay that. Uh, they're living at home. They don't have any expenses. Let them start making money and saving while they're living at home. Take advantage of that. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I believe when we say an inheritance here, we often think about generational wealth. I die. I leave it to my children. But that's really not what it's talking about. It's talking about all the wisdom that you leave them. Because if you leave them just the money, they can waste it because they don't have the wisdom to be able to use it. So when we talk about inheritance, we're talking about the knowledge of the things of God, along with the other material things. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about. And then we'll close here. Look at this chart. I want to just show you this chart, and then we'll close. But if you look at this chart, it's an example of the way comp compounding interest works. That's my favorite word. I don't like the word interest. But when you put compounding interest, that's a good word, right? So here's some different scenarios, and I love this. But let's look at these three, and then we'll close. But if you look at Aaron, Aaron, how old is Aaron? He's 20 years old. He's a young man, right? He saves $2,000 for 10 years. So that's a total of $20,000. So he sets that aside, and for 10 years, every year, he, he puts aside $2,000 invested in a compounding interest, money market account, or whatever the case may be. Now you got Bob, he's 30 years old. He saves 2000 but for 35 years. So he sets aside $70,000. That's his initial investment. Then you have Carl, who's 40 years old, saves 2000 for 25 years. It's $50,000, okay? At the end of that 40-year period, or whatever it is, who has the most money? The 20-year-old. Who invested the least? The 20-year-old. That's why it's important to teach our children to start investing early. And if they start doing it early, they'll continue doing it. Just like giving. If they start giving when they're young, they'll give when they're older, right? So that's why we do that. And so 
I wish I knew this when I was younger. I had people telling me, but they didn't show it to me like this. I think you need to see it, right? We need to see it. So I pray that's been a blessing to you this morning. And so let's go ahead and close in prayer. We'll have our service here in about 12 minutes or so. I'm sorry, no, seven minutes. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, these principles that we're learning. Lord, I pray that these will be a blessing to folks, Lord, even those who are able to go watch the videos online as we try to move forward to be wise stewards of what you've blessed us with and as we continue to build your church. Lord, I thank you for these principles you've laid out in our words. I thank you for how we're able to take these and be able to use them to bring glory and honor to you. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we have a special service this morning. I think of all the festivities. I think of the monologue that we're going to get a chance to listen to and see today. I think about the message that Pastor Isaac's going to bring. I think about uh, the food and the fellowship. There's so much going on this morning in the house of the Lord, and so we're grateful. We're very grateful. We thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll see you in a few minutes.